here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of Steve Mack, who was in that petrol emotion um, from the mid-80s through to the mid-90s. They have just got a box set that's come out on Demon Records titled Every Beginning Has a Future, Anthology 1984 to 1994. This is a 7-CD box set, 121 tracks, including five studio albums and one live album and lots of other bits and pieces, non-album, B-sides, bonus tracks, remixes, live recordings, etc, etc. And it also features a 52-page booklet um, which has been written by the author John Harris, who we love. Anyway, this is the interview. So after several minutes of casual chat with Steve, we got down to that exciting subject that was the release of this incredible box set of That Petrol Emotion. Steve, tell us more about how this all came into being. Yeah, it, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, it's 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 funny because, um, you know, we, we have a still... Uh, passionate fan base uh on 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 facebook and whatnot and and good lord they're constantly rerunning the which is the best song which is the top song which song would you like to play on a rainy day a sunny day i mean they're just they are amazing fans right and then when the pandemic hit when we all basically got stuck behind zoom windows and we all had a little bit more time on our hands we decided to start doing listening parties we you know tim was doing his stuff and uh, we had sort of reached out, say, hey, Tim, fancy doing a listening party. And it was, ding, here, pin drop, right? And so we thought, okay, we'll bugger it. We'll, we'll do our own, right? So I did the first listening party where I literally just put the record on and put a camera facing the turntable and then would pop on the camera every now and then. Um, and the rest of the petrols were like, well, we want to participate as well. And then the people listening were like, well, we want to ask questions. So we said, okay, we, we stepped it up and we started doing little Zoom webcasts. And not only was it brilliant, but it was also, uh, it allowed us to sort of re-examine our own history in a way that we hadn't done before, right? You know, the petrols, we've gotten together periodically when I've been able to get over there for work or for just visiting. Um, But I think enough water's finally gone under the bridge that we can look back at that time (laughs) and sort of really sort of reassess what we accomplished. And... This all coincided with, you know, the record companies essentially granting us amnesty for our back catalog. You know, at a certain point, they just go, all right, we're never going to see any money off of this, are we? Uh, And so they just said, we're going to wipe the debt out. So at that point, it becomes a lot easier. And then Mm. Demon, our first record company, who have since been absorbed by the BBC, said, hey, how about we put out a box set? It was like, and it all just fell together at, at the right time, right? We said, yeah, that sounds brilliant. Can we please be involved? Can we help out with the artwork? Can we help choose the tracks? And uh, over the last year, it's it's all come together and it's it's uh, all rather timely as, as you've admitted yourself. Yeah, well, it, do, it does seem to be, there are several things that happened because when I've sometimes asked people, you know, like, oh God, I'd love to do an interview with you about your band. And they said, sometimes I'd say, if you ask me five, years ago 10 years i'd have definitely said no but there's been enough kind of water under the that bridge <laughs> there's <laughs> enough processing actually you know i kind of can look back and start to feel a little bit happier about some of the things and and not so annoyed about some of the th- other things that slightly tripped us up or completely did us in and, uh-huh. and you know i can let go of the fact that we never saw a penny from the all this work that we did for five <laughs> or ten years and and it's interesting in the sense that it has been a bit of a re-evaluation of that period and and i don't think it's completely about that sort of rose-tinted sunglasses and this well it's nostalgia but at the same time you know, I've kind of gone back to listen to things that I didn't hear the first time from that period and thought, God, this is a really good album. Actually, this is really quite a good band. And I kind of vaguely knew them. But, you know, in the 80s, you know, we had John Peel. You could read the, you know, the music papers, but you couldn't actually hear the songs, could you? So sometimes, you know, a band would come, right. you'd you'd hear about it and it would just go. And then, you, you know, you'd pick up another band that you liked because you know you knew them and that that was it and then you know you get to a certain age and then you have to worry about other things so pop music doesn't play the everything in your life anymore so it's kind of interesting that that re-evaluation has really come together so with this this is a really comprehensive you know 
this is what you would love to put together, isn't it, in your dreams? And it's all happened because it's a seven CD box set, isn't it, with 121 tracks? It's kind of amazing, isn't it? I, you know, in my ideal world, it would be a vinyl set um, because I'm, you know, I'm still playing records. I still shop in the local record stores. I'm, I'm very fortunate that less than a mile away, I've got an absolutely fantastic record store. Uh, and they've got a huge used section as well, which I call the old man section, where I can go and get, you know, three records from the 80s for a tenor, right? Yes. So it's it's perfect for me. But getting back to our box set, yeah, it is absolutely comprehensive. And one of the things that the listening parties made us realize is that, you know, even some of our, our most ardent fans didn't realize we had a track on the Leonard Cohen compilation or a track on the Captain Beefheart compilation or, you know, some of our B-sides that were, you know, on the flip side of a the third version of a 12-inch, you know, when we were putting out four or five 12-inches for a single back, they were when they were trying to do anything to sell records, some of those tracks, you know, got out there and, and basically weren't heard. So now we actually have a forum where you can say, okay, this is all of the stuff. Give it a listen. And during the course of the listening parties, we actually realized, hey, <laughs> these are all good records. You know, there's a couple that we sort of shunted to the side and we shall never speak of them again. And they're not on the box set. But uh, for the most part, I, I think the quality of our output was consistently high. The songs still stand up. The sounds, for the most part, there's a, there's you know some of the records sound a bit eighty ish, a bit too much drum machine on the uh, second album, but you know the the songs are still there. Yes, absolutely. The, the the you know it's rocking. I mean, just curious. I mean, um, you know, I'm I was born sixty four, so I'm now in my late fifties. My early musical world was the glam world of Sweet and Slade and T Rex, Gary Glitter. But luckily, David oh, yeah. Bowie was my first single and first love with Space Oddity. That had the B side of Changes and Velvet Goldmine. I thought all B sides were that good, but I was disappointed <laughs> ever since. Um, yeah, right. that slightly set the bar quite high, didn't it? What was your kind of musical awakening? Because obviously, this was in you know East Anglia, you know, in the countryside during you know you know the uk in the 60s and 70s what was you obviously from america aren't you he says yeah but at the same time so first of all same age as you essentially born in 63 uh and i was born and brought up on the east coast of the united states so born and raised in new york to begin with um and my first single other than the sort of pinky and perky type things that your grandma gave you uh was penny lane and strawberry fields how about that? And yes, I just thought, oh, that's... all records are just good, right? That's good. <laughs> um, and I remember forcing my dad into a record store and making him buy the Simon and Garfunkel album, Wednesday Morning, 6 a.m., which had Sounds of Silence on it. Another amazing record, which I still own to this day. Um, and when I was growing up, we moved around a lot. My father worked for uh, a car company that moved him around a lot. And so... I got a wild upbringing. So I spent, you know, three years in Puerto Rico where I absorbed all, all kinds of Latin influenced music, which I still adore. Mm. It's heavily rhythmic, lots of brass. And then I went, I moved to Japan. And at that point, that's when I picked up, Japan was very much tuned into the British scene. So I too was listening to all the glam music, the sweet David Bowie, you know, all of that stuff just sort of, you know, straight into my DNA at the same time is that was the first time I heard heavy metal. So like all of a sudden I'm hearing Trampled Underfoot by Led Zeppelin and going, My. what is this, <laughs> right? Yes. And then coming back to the US in the 70s and absorbing all that amazing AM radio pop and the disco and then going to FM radio and uh, all of the hard rock and then eventually ACDC, which then led into punk rock and then I took a left turn and just never came back, right? Once I heard the buzzcocks and the undertones, it was like, okay, this is this is the perfect combination. It's got the melody. It's got the aggression. Uh, it's danceable. You know, Gang of Four, just amazing, right? It, yes. It's, it's part of the journey that just never ends. Yeah, so in the UK, 79, Thatcher gets in, you get Reagan. Then we have the Falkland War. We have Green and Common. We have, you know, inner city rioting. And then, you know, oh, um, yeah. a, bit, a few years later, we had Red Wedge and sort of uh, the Socialist Workers' Party in full force with obviously the the Communards and Jimmy Som um, Somerville. 
yeah. what's level, and uh, yeah. Paul Weller and all those guys. <laughs> so what was your kind of, because that formative moment, 16, 17, where one might be leaving school, did you at that stage go on to college or did you, you know, take on the Jack Kerouac moment and go, right, I'm going on the road? A little of both, really. You know, I I, I was one of the few people I actually, I really enjoyed school. <laughs> I, I, I just... I, I did, you know, I'm a big math guy. I'm also a big computer guy. And I really enjoyed just being learning about things. And, you know, my early physics classes taught me about audio and I was a huge stereo fan. And I just, you know, learning physics made me realize why speakers go in and out and why guitars sound the way they did. So I loved all that. Yes. At the same time, I did buy a motorcycle and take it across country in the U.S. So I've done the Jack Kerouac thing. Um, and when you guys were having all the Thatcher stuff, we were having all the same shit over here in the guise of Ronald Reagan. And we had the dead Kennedys, right? When I heard the yes. dead Kennedys, it was like, this is it, right? These guys, like it was more of that punk rock with the melody, but just these insightful political lyrics. And to me, that's what punk rock was about was a deliberate, you know, saying, I am not going to do the the things that other people are doing like when we pierced our ears and went to punk shows it was a political statement back then as it was in the early days over in the uk you know now you see kids dressed up with their spiky mohawks and you know, i feel like the old man waving his fist that's not what we fought the punk rock wars for right yes you're this supposed is to true. be better than that it's not fashion this is true. But then sort of at that period of that post of that punk and post punk period, there was kind of then 83, 82, 83, the Smiths appeared, you know, the great, you know, indie world for five years. Mm -hmm. There was this kind of, I know there was other scenes, there was a goth scene, there was a new, uh, I don't know, a narco punk scene, there was new right. Paisley scene, there was, you know, huge amount of little tribes that were coming up. But what was it, you know, were you still in the USA at this stage in the sort of, uh, you know, like up to 83, 84? Because obviously, eighty five and there's new a new compilation that's come out on Cherry Red Records C eighty five. I know they're going that way now. They've got your first single, Keen. So what happens to you in that kind of the grey zone of the the early eighties right. to eighty five? Well, it's interesting because um, I didn't really, you know, over in the US, it all came under the same rubric as alternative, or back then it wasn't even alternative; it was just college radio. So you'd hear the Sisters of Mercy and go, wow, that's brilliant, right? And then you'd hear Alien Sex Fiend and you that is great. And then you'd hear the Paisley Underground stuff, the Long Riders. And it was just so different from what was being played on commercial radio. We didn't really have any barriers over here. We all listened to all of it and thought it was great. And then in 84, uh, I jumped on a plane and ended up after touring around uh, Europe for four months, ended up in London. And I got to see the tribalism firsthand, which, you know, coming from Seattle, you know, people think that, you know, when grunge happened, like it was a uniform we were wearing. It wasn't. That's just how everybody dressed. It was bloody cold in Seattle. So we wore <laughs> wool shirts and thermal underwear underneath our Levi's jeans because we couldn't afford new ones. And they'd have holes in them. So I show up with my grunge uniform and I go to start going to clubs and I hit a goth club and everybody was goth. They were <laughs> literally had the uniform on and i was like wow look at those girls and then, then i'd go to a you know a 60s club because i love 60s psychedelia and everyone looked like a hippie and i like i realized that every you could you know on the on the on the tube you could look around and you go okay there's a rockabilly there's a goth yes. there's a paisley underground it was so set like how you would look and i would just wander around these clubs always feeling like an outcast but able to enjoy them all because I just, I didn't care. I just loved all of the stuff. So right? did you find and places like Alice in Wonderland, this kind of this slightly psychedelic club that had, um, it was a guy who did, oh God. A, yeah, um, I was there Dick. every week. I went every Monday night <laughs> right. to gossip, right? And it was amazing. And then when they did um, Dr. And the Medics. Dr. The Medics, right? Spirit I was like, in the sky. I know that guy. He did. I couldn't believe he put a single out and I had seen them play at a number of different things. And they were actually quite a reasonable psychedelia band and then spirit in the sky hit. I'm like, that's not even their best song, but I was super excited for them because I knew that he'd been DJing 
every night for years, right? And I just, I thought it was great that him and the, the girls dancing behind him, I'm like, I know them. Those are those pretty hippie girls. That yes, are there every you go. So I, I did, I did, I did, a, I did a great interview with him once because he was being managed by Stuart Copeland, the famous, no, Miles Copeland. And Miles, um, yeah. it was one of those kind of almost like a spinal tap where the band weren't in the room, but, you know, he, I can't remember his name, now, actually, the, the main guy anyway. And, uh -huh. he, and, and uh, Miles does that whole, this hasn't got a fucking hit on this fucking record. Get me a fucking hit, <laughs> you know, and it was one of those, right, record this fucking yeah. song. We've got a hit at last, you know, and it was like, okay, you know. So it was kind of quite an amusing moment. He he did a Miles, you know, you probably had that experience as well occasionally, I don't know. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And everybody in the band has, has had that moment um, and in some ways, uh, the, although, you know, you don't want management or a record company to impose their values and their vision upon you, um, and I think this is something that happened to the Petrols, you can also disappear up your own rear end, right? So when we put out our third album and said, we can put out a, you know, a complete dance song complete with 808 drum kits and no freaking guitars and we can put that on the same record as something that has under the sky which is a sonic youth ripoff right a good one yeah. but nevertheless <laughs> you know and that was just ridiculous right it like, never was going to fly and our manager should have said no you're not going to do that write some more guitar songs put out a petrol's record and then you and raymond and kieran put this other thing out under a different name you know, because your audience isn't going to go there with you. And they didn't. Right. So yes. I'm not blaming anybody. You know, I'm I'm far too old and and too much water has gone under the bridge. It was super fun. But, you know, it was commercial suicide. Right. And and <laughs> we never should have done it. Well, it I, I remember I remember when Lemmy, who was the roadie for well, one of the roadies for Jimi Hendrix, talking about Hendrix kind of going into experimental jazz and Lemmy in the way that he spoke went that was going to be just complete shit. <laughs> you know, it was just like, yeah, oh, Lemmy. yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure if, you know, I know we didn't want Jimmy to die. I mean, I was too young to know, but I'm sure his music might have gone a bit odd and like, mm, I'm not sure about this anyway. I, you but, know, I, I thought about, I, I think he just would have gone, he probably would have joined Miles Davis, right? And just made some mind-blowingly amazing jazz records. Now, his pop fans might not have followed him along the way, but, you know, there was... I think there was still a lot of great music left in him. Yes, I think he would have struggled though. Oh, God, I mean, would I think he punk would have really confused him. I don't know. I think he would have just gone like, "What the hell are these kids thinking about?" You know, I don't know. He might have just sounded like a, a few of my heroes, Morrissey. Um, you think um, <laughs> it's a bit tricky, you know? Anyway, that's Morrissey. Um, so look. Did you ever, going back to 84, did you ever go to sort of Alan McGee's club, you know, the living room and places like that? Well, interestingly enough, uh, the reason why the Petrols originally came over to London was to play the living room club and to meet Alan. And Alan had told John O'Neill that, like, I want to put out your next single. Right. And I wasn't in the band yet. I was down in Brixton watching Alan's other band the Jesus and Mary chain play a five minute gig and then start a riot at the Brixton firehouse. So I was there during those early, early formative days of the Mary chain. And I was a huge fan of the records, but every time I went to go see them live, they would just cause a riot. And I'm like, can you guys actually play music or do you just, <laughs> you just cause riots? They were so shit. Those first <laughs> few gigs. Um, but I had the early records cause Peel was playing them and I thought they were amazing. Yeah. Anyhow. So, the boys came over, met Alan, went and played a, a gig there. And then Alan said, I can't put your record out right now because I've got this band called The Mary Chain. I've got to put out their records. And that's when the Petrols decided to go with um, Pink Records instead because they were dying to get a record out. Like they wanted to put something out. And it was right about, they actually went and recorded the first single without me. And then they through a mutual connection at a restaurant I was working at, they found me and asked me to audition because they didn't like the the lead vocals on the recording. So had so you already ever... had you already been a singer in other bands? How did you when did you discover your voice? 
Uh, I'm, I had not, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I sang in the choir in like elementary school. Um, and I, I had drunkenly jumped on stage and sang a monkey's song with some mates of mine in Seattle one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember thinking like, like everybody went nuts. And my mate said to me, he leaned over and he said, you know, you should be a singer. But at the time I was in college and I was, I was like, I can't be a singer. Like, you know, being in a band just isn't a career option in the U S it is now. Right. And people have an awareness, but back in the eighties, it was like, are you kidding? There was no place to play in Seattle. Mm. You go play in each other's living rooms, which is why grunge happened because we just played for each other in each other's basements. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be in a band. I mean, I, the greatest feeling I ever had in my life was seeing Iggy Pop or seeing Gang of Four or seeing bands that would fundamentally change my body chemistry for that hour that you're watching them. And I just thought, man, I want to do that. And when I was in London working in restaurants and you'd get the Melody Maker and there'd be those three or four pages at the back where they'd have musicians wanted ads, I'd circle them every week And then I would chicken out because at the time, if you had an American accent, if you spoke to anybody, people would just wind you up and take the piss because you were an American. Oh, Ronald Reagan, blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, fuck you, Maggie (laughs) Thatcher. Shut up. Right. But, you know, I was young and and very, very shy. And the only reason this thing ever happened with the petrols is they were they were mates with this one waitress who was one of the nicest creatures ever to walk this earth and i figured well if they're friends of hers they must at least be nice right they, they won't yell at me yeah and I, I went and met them and we just were like brothers from another mother we just we had the same records in our collections we loved the same things and that's how it all started right it was just a cinderella story i happened to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right band god in the pizza place and amazing prince andrew wasn't there as well um <laughs> <laughs> one of his alibis um yeah. so had you done your your not eurovision um oh god what's it called interrailing was that an interrailing thing you did you know for your um gap year or year off around europe well it, it's not really it, it was my own version of, of such thing like i was uh, getting ready i was supposed to graduate from college in 84 and i just realized i didn't want to i wasn't quite ready and and in my chosen field, which was computer science at the time, there just weren't that many people doing it. And most of the jobs you could get were absolute shit, right? You were writing accounting systems for corporations. And I had been writing accounting systems throughout my college career to, to pay for my college. And I just couldn't bear the idea that I would keep doing that. So I decided to take a year off traveling, which for me meant at first, I talked about it so much myself, a mate decided he was going to come along. And by the time we got over there, there were four of us. We went to Amsterdam and we bought a Volkswagen combi van and tricked it out. We built some beds into it. And then we drove it all the way around Europe, literally down through Yugos- the former Yugoslavia, through Greece, up through Italy, Spain. And then we just we ended up in London after four months. And once I got to London, I realized... I never wanted to leave. It was the most fantastic city in the world at the time. Blimey, you were living out the Men at Work song, weren't you, really? <laughs> and um, that was very kind of exciting stuff. My God, that's so useful. It's so Jack Kerouac, isn't it? So look, there is one major thing here. You're quite a young kid with no history, and this is a band who were the undertones, basically. That's quite, um, there is kind of like, they did write some of the greatest, you know, pop songs, rock songs of, of modern time, really. So was it, a, you know, obviously... What was it like having a ready-made band minus, you know, their old lead singer? Well, I mean, I, I I will tell you the first thing I did is I called my mates long distance and just screamed at him, I'm in the undertones! I'm in the undertones! <laughs> right? Yeah. And he, of course, Raymond and Kieran would have just killed me if they knew I'd said that. But, you know, like I was with the O'Neill brothers. Like, what else could you say, right? And the irony is that um, I had loved... The first Undertones record, I bought it and I sold it back because I couldn't bear Fiergal's voice, even though I love the guitars. And then a couple of months later, I went back and bought it again because I love <laughs> the song so much. And this is no uh, no slight on Fiergal. I, I, like, g- genuinely nice guy. Met him many times over the years. And I came to love his voice for what it was. But initially, I didn't. So now I'm the new Fiergal, right? 
And that came, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, all of the pubs could put X undertones on the uh, on the handbill and we'd sell out, right? So I didn't really have to struggle on my way up and play to rooms with five people. Like from our first gig, there was a hundred people there, right? And it just got bigger from there. But, you know, to toot my own horn a little bit, I didn't suck clearly because people kept coming and more and more people kept coming. And I, I kind of gr- had to grow up in front of the audience and, and learn how to sing and learn how to work an audience and do all that stuff. Um, but it certainly didn't hurt that we've got John O'Neill there cranking out amazing songs that I got to sing. Right. Yes. And then, and also with, with Raymond's amazing lyrics on top of there. And then later on, Kieran would start writing and Damien would write off. So like I was, so fortunate to join a band that with four skilled members and believe me i've been in quite a few bands since then and <laughs> it's it's not quite the same when you join a band that doesn't have four great writers so you know looking back i i i was incredibly fortunate yes and that first single is a bit odd isn't it because had they recorded it and then there was an issue with the speed and then you had to try and put your vocals over it which kind of created yeah. even more work rather than just starting from scratch well it was you know keen is written in the key of e right so you just open on the guitars and you're playing ead right it's and that's the key that everybody writes in because that's the key guitars come in the problem is is i have a high voice and just like your hero morrissey my key is f sharp which is actually two frets up um and in fact some you know later on we had some guitars that were just tuned into crazy tunings in f sharp uh because if we wrote anything in that i could sing it um but what we had to do because the first because keen was written in the key of e is they sped up the tape a little bit to make it sound slightly pinky perky and i sang along to that which was fine and we should have left it like that but instead what they did is then they slowed it back down to the original key and that's why my voice sounds like this. Because when you you when you speed up voices, it makes things sound tighter. When you slow them down, it starts to get sloppy. And that's why it doesn't quite sound like me because it isn't. It's me slowed down by a semitone or two. Yes, that's a very strange moment, isn't it? So you go from the pink label, which I know, I, I can't remember his name. I've done an interview with him, which is embarrassing. Isn't Simon it? and Paul. Paul, that's Paul I spoke to. And um, yeah, yeah, so they had an amazing little roster of bands. But obviously, you know, I remember him just saying they got exhausted and tired and their resources were slightly stretched. So you you signed to Demon Records quite quickly after that. Yep. And then for the debut album, you go to the famous Rockfields, don't you? Which is kind of quite the classic place that had all those um well it's had a brilliant documentary made but also you know we've had i think it was black sabbath and queen and various other bands have all been there and done it what was it like going from america to a little farm place with some local farmers which was quite interesting well i you know i to be perfectly honest i wasn't aware of the history of rockfield other than the undertones said, hey, we recorded there. It was brilliant. I'm like, okay, great. Let's go. Um, and I had heard of, you know, Zeppelin recording out at Hadley Grange and things like that. So I, I was aware of like, wow, okay, this is cool. We're going to go out into the country. We're not going to have any distractions. And quite frankly, recording in London is a pain in the ass, particularly if you're poor, like most musicians are, because you're literally having to hoof your amplifiers into the tube or God forbid a cab where you'd have to spend your entire month's dole money just to get the cab to, to get your amplifier. And then at the end of the day, you, you you don't leave it in the recording studio because somebody might steal it. You're like, don't you guys lock the doors? I mean, like, it's just <laughs> awful, like recording in London. And plus, there's every distraction in the world, right? There yes. are fantastic pubs fantastic clubs and you spend more time you know drinking than you do actually working so the idea of getting out to the country is fantastic and i loved it because i mean it's you wake up in the morning you think about your songs you work on your songs 12 hours disappears in a snap and then you go to sleep and you do the next thing the next day i mean it's the best life ever for a musician like all you have to do is get up and and think about your songs just amazing and then It was also good because, you know, three of us had never done that before. So Raymond and Kieran and I were just like completely 
uh, bowled over by the reality of like, oh my God, this is our life. This is our life. We get to make records at Rockfield. This is so great. Um, and so the, the the other, the, the final thing about it is like, you're also, you're spending all your time with each other. You're cooking for each other. You're spending this really concentrated, focused time together. And that time in the trenches is what forms the bonds that last a lifetime, right? You know, there's, yes. there's one thing about playing in clubs in London and hoofing your gear back and forth, but when you're cooking dinner for each other and waking up and yeah, it's just, it's the best. It is the best. And yes, I could imagine that that kind of community experience is amazing. So the album, it, it kind of happens and it does sound incredible. For a debut album, you must have been so pleased. And obviously it's a good thing. It's just, it, it immediately gets attention. Because uh -oh. the great thing with the UK is that we have the gatekeepers, don't we? We have three weekly music papers with huge circulations and John Peel's show. And there's also, you know, Janice Long and Kid Jensen. And every little town and city in the UK has a indie alternative night. So you can get in your little transit and just get that kind of buzz very quickly, can't you? So, <laughs> you know, that first album did take off really well, didn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it was the double-edged sword again, because not when you have five music publications on a weekly or monthly basis, you know, there is a bit of the what's new, what's next, what's next, right? Uh, so as quickly as you can become the, the press darling, you can also fall out of favor very quickly. And if you fall out of favor, there's somebody coming up behind you, right? Which we would find out years later, when we put out, when we were putting out what we thought were some of our strongest records, like Chemic Crazy and in particular Fireproof, and Fireproof gets relegated to, you know, not the full page review, but just in the alphabetical section. And you're like, but, but wait, yeah. you loved us. What have we done wrong? Um, but absolutely. And, and particularly for somebody coming from the, from Seattle, um, we would, you know, if you were in a band in Seattle, you were lucky to get gigs around Seattle, right? And and then the, the nearest gig is three hours away in Portland or four hours away in Spokane. And then you're playing to in a, like a smaller little town. The fact that you can get in a transit van and an hour later, there's going to be another pub where another hundred people want to come see you is just something that I hope never goes away in the UK. You know, I've been talking to my friends over there and asking like, are people still playing? Are they still getting in transit vans and playing around? And they're like, well, sort of, but you know, the kids aren't really that much into rock these days. I hope they don't, I hope they realize that, you know, that is something that nobody else has, right? The yes. UK just has the best music scene in the world and it's the best place to find your feet and to find out who you are as a band because you can really work it and put yourself in front of literally a hundred thousand people over the course of a summer. Right. And that's, that's how you get better. That's how you get good. Yes, absolutely. And then, I mean, obviously, as you, as you sort of alluded to there, the, the kind of the great, the kind of narrative of a band, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, there's a kind of concentrated period and there's a kind of a zeitgeist that you might be in if you're really lucky. And then there's another moment that another chapter comes that you might not be part, but we'll, we'll part right. that. But then your follow-up album, it does have the one of the, it has several amazing songs. And obviously Big Decision is the one that kind of blows us completely yep. skywards. And is that the same year that I saw you, not only at the UEA, did you play Glastonbury that year or was it the following year that Glastonbury appeared? for you guys because 87 was my you first did. class and then I went 89 and I definitely saw that petrol emotion at one of them we played 86 and 87 so right. we played 86 uh after right I was it after Manic Pop Thrill or before Manic Pop Thrill? I can't remember but we had uh, our booking agent uh did a, just a fantastic job and he had booked a lot of the other bands at Glastonbury. And he said, hey, I got this new up and coming band. It's got a couple of O'Neill brothers in it. And so we actually played the main stage, even though it was on like, you know, 10 o'clock or in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning or something. Like that. But it was still main stage yes. in 86. And then we went back and played it in 87 again. Um, yeah. To be honest, I mean, Husker Du played in the afternoon on Friday on 87. And to be honest, I missed them because I didn't turn up until a bit later. <laughs> 
That was so annoying. <laughs> but um, yeah, so what the, the song, Big Decision, I mean, it is one of the greats of our time, isn't it? And it does sort of like every time you ever play it, it does sound amazing. How did that song develop? Because it took me years to work out there was this other track by, I know everyone's going to tell you this, aren't they? Big um, Brother D and the Collective and Effort. Collective Effort. So there is this um, kind of, because at this stage, I'm obsessed with John Peel. I get my D90 cassette and I put it in, I record it, and I'm thinking, my God, everything is just brilliant. You know, all the indie stuff yeah, is great. Yeah. All the Bundu boys, the public enemy, Roxé Chante, you know, Bulgarian folk, just John Peel, anything, you know, all the reggae, you know, Augustus, Pablo, Gregory Isaacs, you know, it was just like, wow, John Peel just just throws it all at you and then a few years later you get chicago house music and you're thinking yes i love that too john thank you <laughs> i know um, it was a, it was a very fertile time right and and i i would almost argue that the 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 80s and maybe a couple of years you know once we get past the first wave of hip hop i would almost argue that that was kind of the last great flowering of cross pollination where People were just doing crazy stuff that you hadn't heard before. And ever since then, I mean, maybe it's me being an old man, but I've, but I just go like, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that my son, I've got a 12 year old and he's constantly playing me stuff. Uh, and then I'll go to my record collection and I'll go and he'll go, wait, wait, that sounds like, and I'm like, yes, it does. Yes, I'm like, I know. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's how music happens, right? It's the gift that keeps giving. And we keep, you know, jazz was always about, taking from the past and modernizing it. Um, but at just those late eighties were just this explosion of creativity. And, and it was okay for us to listen to the Bundu boys and public enemy and Les Voix Bulgare and test department. And, you know, like you just listen to all of that stuff because it was all just mind blowing at the time. Right. Yes. And, um, uh, Wait a minute. I, I've completely lost track of your original question. <laughs> yes, your big decision. How did that? I mean, how? Where was oh, the, big decision? How did that all right. sort of happen? Because obviously there was like, this is quite amazing. This song. Well, so uh, it started off, you know, like John literally brought in, uh, as he often did, um, a little cassette tape, and he had this tiny, crappy little drum machine going, and he just was strumming on top of it and he didn't do the eh, 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 eh. he would just had he basically was just singing over a drum machine if i remember correctly and it's the typical john o'neill thing like a little nursery rhyme see my honey in the street it's desiree red where she liked and i mean he hands me and he always would just hand like here's the first verse and the first chorus and i remember thinking what like what <laughs> what, what what's this right and then raymond as always, just picks up his guitar, starts playing, gah, 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 gah. and you're like, oh, wait, okay. All right. All right. This is getting interesting. Raymond is just taking it on a hard left, right? Um, and But it was still just a sort of chugging along indie rock song with a little bit of staccato thrown in there. And then in the recording studio, Raymond goes, can I try something? And we're like, of course. And he gets up there and he raps. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Are you kidding me? Like there's Raymond with his blue eyes and his little curly hair quiff, just throwing in this rap. And I'm like, oh man, you've got brass balls. Do you, <laughs> do you really think we're going to do this? And we listen to it and we're like, it's really good. I think we can get away with this, right? And then we just started getting excited about it, thinking that people are going to like lose their minds when they hear Raymond rapping in this song. And of course, that becomes the hook, right? Is what you're going to do in this day and age, you got to agitate as you get organized. And where that comes from is Brother D and the Collective Effort. And that was one of the records that Raymond and John O'Neill used to play in Derry when they, when John was completely like, I'm never going to join a band again. I'm just going to sit in Derry and I'm going to spin records. And he had a DJ gig with Raymond and another friend, Mickey Rooney. And right. the three of them would take them spinning records and Raymond slaps on brother D and John's like, this is great. <laughs> and John started writing songs after that. And then years later, Raymond cribs, you know, the, the main uh, rhyme from that. Yes. sticks it on a big decision, throws a little Irish twist. And the cool thing is we got to meet Brother D 
in Washington, D.C., years later. And we were kind of nervous, right? Because, I, you know, he could come in and go, what the fuck, guys? Like, how <laughs> dare you? Yes. Uh, even though we did credit him on the record, we said, you know, like it is from Brother D and the collective effort. He came in and he was so gracious. He was like, I am so excited for you guys. And I think it's great that you guys are continuing to push the envelope. And like it was it was it was what you really want a meeting like that to be. We just sat around and just shot the shit together and asked him like what other records he's been listening to. And he asked us what we've been listening to. And just just amazing. Yes, absolutely. And then sort of interestingly enough, kind of for me, you know, slightly simplistic on this bit, but sort of 83 to 87, the years of the Smiths. And then after that, there's this kind of, uh, you know, a lot of the indie bands kind of fall to the wayside because they just had enough. And also ecstasy comes along. I mean, what's that like for you as a band that suddenly there's a slightly another party going on? And then we have the dance scene and people, some bands like the Soup Dragons and Primal Scream and the Happy Mondays have made that jump, the Wolfhound and the primitives and my um the mighty lemon drops definitely didn't and um, <laughs> so there is this kind of and then you got the orb and 808 state and then we had a guy called gerald so as a band and you're thinking there's definitely a new there's a new chapter starting to happen here what's it like when you come to do your third album because that's there's there's a bit of a shift isn't there well it's funny um first of all like let's talk about drugs like e hits the scene and I was just like, oh, my God, you guys, I did this back in college. Right. And we weren't doing E. We were doing MD, MDA, not MDMA, which is a lot stronger and a lot more psychedelic. And all, the, all along comes E, which is this like it's a drug for people who don't want to take drugs. Right. It just it, it makes you high for a couple of hours and makes you just want to hug everybody, which is I have no problem with that. I think love goes a long way and makes everybody a lot uh, easier to get along with. But you have these people going, oh, it's amazing. We're going to change the world. And I'm like, no, you're just high, right? <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to go through that when you're 18, right? And then you go, oh, drugs are fun, but we're not going to change the world. It's just when you need to sort of rinse out your brain and, and reset yourself, right? So, and then we had people like, and, and Jack, what's his name? And Sounds writing these articles about how we're going to change the world with E and the Happy Mondays. And you're like, are you serious? How did this get past the editor? You guys are writing like 16 year olds, not like music critics. So I was super annoyed that drugs were like this new thing that were hijacking the scene. Second of all, as a long-term electronic music enthusiast, like I grew up on craft work, right? And I grew up on Billy Preston and all of the, and Stevie Wonder and like where electronic music first started and Wendy Carlos Williams and stuff. And then people are like the fucking soup dragons, like, come on, that stuff sucked. Right. And they're like, Oh, I'm free to do what I want. Like, yeah, you should be fired is what you should be. Like that is a <laughs> terrible single should never have hit the charts. And so here we are, we're putting out what we think is a good record and we've done what we think is a good combination of alternative music with dance beats and stuff behind it. And we we can't even get a glance at the charts and you have records by the Soup Dragons charting. I like, at that point, we just started losing it going, okay, we're totally out of sync here. What 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 is What is going on? What is wrong? And look, Happy Mondays made some brilliant records, right? Like, and and they were great live. That's the thing that everybody discounts. Like Soup Dragons couldn't perform that shit live. Neither could Primal Scream, right? They mm -hmm. they they had a big hit and they couldn't play that shit live, right? Mm -hmm. Happy Monday always delivered live. They were an amazing band live. Even James, they kind of flirted on the edges of that, but they were a great live band, right? And and as a musician, that's my acid test, right? Can you guys play this shit, right? Mm -hmm. Can you guys really deliver? Craftwork delivers. Craftwork are amazing live, right? And yes. it's not coming off sensors. They're playing that stuff. So I was just super annoyed because you had basically a bunch of no talents hitting the charts with songs that weren't good songs or were cover versions that they couldn't play live. So it was extremely frustrating for us. Yes, I can tell. That's that's amazing. <laughs> 
There you go. <laughs> it, but there was, but there was also. Can I tell you how I really feel? <laughs> yes, because but then you from the North London scene, you had people like Silverfish, you had the Faith Healers, My Bloody Valentine, Carter, the Unstoppable Sex Machine coming up, and I remember you know seeing the butthole surfers you know somewhere in the subterranean and thinking, God, this is the future of music. So I mean, there was just a lot. I was of- there. I was at that gig. What? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure we were at a million gigs together, David. I mean, we were, we were there. I'm sure, man. I was, in fact, little known fact, I actually offered the Butthole Surfers uh, some highly illicit substances that I had in my in my possession at the time because I knew that they liked to perform out of their minds. But they took took one look at me and they're like, "Yeah, no thanks, dude." <laughs> <laughs> well, I do remember. I think Paul Smith from Blast First was kind of there as well, and being very excited because it's the famous Paul Smith, wasn't it? So, um, yeah, he Paul's used, a yeah, great guy. Yes, it may, amazing. And his and his partner wife is kind of in the band of Susans, which is amazing. So, um, it's all good, isn't it? Yeah. So, look, your end of the millennium psychosis blues. I mean, so was that a difficult album for you guys? Then was that a tricky? Yeah, I mean it was super difficult for 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 two reasons. Uh one, the 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 songs were were too far apart, right? We were you know, we we had the amazing conceit that we could take people along with us on the journey that we took through our record collections, which included Roxanne Chante and Brother Dean the Collective Effort and Curtis Mayfield. Uh but it had not really truly been reflected in our music other than just a, a little hints of it on, on Babel. But, you know, even though there was a rap on Babel, it was essentially just sort of a, an indie angular guitar record. Um, and then all of a sudden we came up with some stuff on Millennium that just is kind of unclassifiable. And, and, and in retrospect, it's just not that good. Gogglebox is not a great song. Tension is not a great song, right? Groove Check, I love Groove Check. I mean, it was sampled by other rap artists. That's how good Groove Check is, but it shouldn't have been on a Petrol's record, right? It should have been a secret side project. Yes. And so, the but on the other hand, Cellophane is brilliant, right? Under the Sky is brilliant, right? There's There's some, you know, there's some really great songs. Sooner or later is a great song. There's some good songs on there, but I, I, I don't think we had enough songs. We really should have had another 10 songs and winnowed it down to the best. Like Genius Move should have been on that record. It wasn't, right? Stup- you, know, you know, number five in a catalog of 100 stupid moves that the Petrols made. That was one of them. Yes. And then to complicate all this, um, it, during the first week of recording that album, not at the end of the album, not even after we'd finished recording and moved to mixing, but literally like on the second or third day, John O'Neill just, he was drinking a bunch of whiskey and he's like, ah, I can't hold it in any longer. I got to tell you guys, I'm leaving the band. Oh, great. Great. Way to let the air out of the room, right? <laughs> Everyone just sat there with their jaws on the table going, what? And he's like, yeah. And then basically at that point, because he had his wife and child with him, he disappeared. He basically was absent, right? And John was kind of the unspoken leader of the band at that point. And I was so angry. I was so angry at him. But I mean, that was my default, you know, response to a lot of things. I was an angry young man, right? But, you know, the rest of them just got super depressed. And so it the, the record sounds depressed, right? <laughs> That's what we were feeling. Unfortunately, it's a snapshot of the way we were feeling at the time. And instead of being made under better circumstances and saying, okay, you know what? We're going to do this crazy record, but we're going to, we're like, uh, whereas Babel is is full of this bravado, right? Like we made this record and you're going to like it because we are awesome, right? Uh, uh, You know, Millennium sounds like, well... We like these records. You probably won't, but here's a, here's our shot at it, right? And it wasn't until Kama Crazy that we got our mojo back and started getting that, like, this, we are great. You're going to love these songs because they're freaking great songs, right? And so there was just, and we lost so much inertia. And quite frankly, you know, with all of a sudden when we're big decision and we're playing gigs, I'm looking out in the audience and I'm seeing secretaries and postal workers. And, you know, you're just, I I just saw, oh my God, the great, like everyone is here. 
Yes. And then by the time Millennium comes around, whoop, like everyone's gone. And I can see the Petrols fans are still there because they will always be there. God bless them. Yes. But we blew it, right? Because at that point, then the audience has moved on and they, they moved on to Oasis and the Happy Mondays and everybody else. Um, well, I suppose it might it might have been Nevermind by then, mind it. No, 19. No, no. I mean, like, Nevermind didn't come out until 91. Um, it was between Chemi Crazy and Fireproof. That's right. Yeah. I don't know. It was funny. 88 to 90. That was a weird period. You would have been... it was it was very strange because on the one hand you had early uh, Nirvana, he, you had he, Mud he, Honey he, and Smashing Pumpkins, but then you had all of the you know the dance stuff coming out of Manchester. Yes. Um, and it was a very, very confused time. It was. And then you had four ADs. Yeah, that was the Pixies and Throwing Musers, wasn't it, at that point as well? But then, yeah. you know, Chemo Crazy does sound amazing. It does sound like a really, I mean, it does seem, sound brilliant today, doesn't it? I mean, being playing it and thinking, this is such a great album. So you managed on the fourth album to pull it all together again. Did did you go and have band ther therapy or did, did the sort of band suddenly gel again? Um, I mean, you know, we... Uh... When we swat, when we brought in our new bass player John Marchini, um, he was a very a dear college friend of Raymond's, and he had this amazing uh, energy. Like he was just so happy to be in a band. Right? He'd been in a band before, Cassandra Complex, and they'd had you know a, a small amount of a little amount of local notoriety on the continent but nothing like what the Petrels had, right? So all of a sudden he's playing to 1500 people, right? And he's like, this is brilliant, right? And so he had this infectious energy that that brought every back up. And then even more importantly, Raymond found his mojo and came up with a handful of songs. And Kieran came up with his songs on Chemic Crazy. And then, you know, we just knew that like, we were onto something like, that, like we just knew these are great songs right? Yes. And, and then getting out and road testing them, particularly in the US when we were out playing clubs that that uh, had a huge amount of meaning for me. We played the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. I had spent a, a summer in D.C. and saw Killing Joke at the 930 Club, and I couldn't believe I was on the same stage. We're playing the Metro in Chicago, where all of my favorite Chicago bands played. And, you know, we're just playing these really amazing venues and we just got excited again right we we remembered why we were in a band and that yes. was just and you'd gone to good. and you'd been on virgin label at this stage weren't you so you had a big change from demon to virgin what was that like because i know a few bands who didn't have a great experience with virgin and it was like a bit of a mm, nail in their coffin really so how did you how did you find going to such a sort of a bigger label no a different label well i mean there was also Polydor in between there. So with with um, first albums, Demon, Indie, great, right? But sort of limited is what you can do. Next album, Polydor, <clears throat> we were signed by the, the, what was it? The general manager, the, you know, like the head guy. But literally right after we put out Babel, he got asked to go work for Paul McCartney and he brought us all in. He said, look, I'm sorry, guys, but Paul McCartney calls once in a lifetime. And we we're like, no, 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 you gotta go. You gotta yes. go. Take, take this gig and then tell us all about it, right? But then the new manager of Polydor, that's when we got the spinal tap meeting. That's when we got the you guys need to start writing hits or you're not gonna be on my label. And being the young, uh, angry young men that we were, we were like, fuck you, we're gonna write whatever we want to write. And our manager happened to find a loophole in the contract. They hadn't sent us a signed notarized letter that said they wanted to renew their option. Right. So we were out of contract and we signed with Virgin, which seemed like a genius move. But the problem is we had all this inertia again, the inertia. We had all this inertia built up with that record label, both in the UK and in the US. We get on a plane, we go to the US and Polydor over there is like, it was Polygram over there. And they're like, well, you're not on our label anymore. So we're, yeah, see ya. And <laughs> Virgin's like, well, we don't, you don't have a record out on Virgin yet. So there's nothing for us to do. So even though we had a great time playing those gigs in front of the audience, like we literally didn't have any major label record support. 
at yes. that point because we didn't have any product out. And so we got caught in this, like by the time the next record came out, we'd lost a bunch of momentum because of that switch, you know, and there's a part of me. And, you know, the, the funny thing is the band basically who he signed to Polydor in our absence was the wonder stuff who ended up doing quite well. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm... you can't attribute to this, to anything like at the end of the day, the wonder stuff made records that people bought and congratulations to them. People still love their records. Love it. You know, I, I don't know what would happen if we, if we would have stayed on Polydor. It's, it's one of those great what if questions, but I can't really complain about Virgin. They, spent a ton of money on us yeah because you had quite quite everything. the producer didn't you as well for for chemical chemical crazy you we know, had, Scott. yeah we had scott lit we recorded in in los angeles we made some ridiculous expensive videos um so it's not as if virgin didn't try but at the same time right when we were uh releasing our record a chap named iggy pop also happened to put out a record which had a hit and so where's the advertising budget going to go? It's going to go to, to Iggy. Right. And I'm fine with that. You know, like he needed the money. I'm good with that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, when the, the vice president of Virgin America says you're our top priority, you think to yourself, Oh yeah, we're, we're definitely not his top priority. He just said that he must be lying. <laughs> yes. I do remember the, what was that Iggy album? I seem to remember it had, um, blah, blah, blah. Oh yes, of course. And what oh, no, no, real... no. it wasn't, it was after that. It, it was brick by brick. Brick by brick, yeah. That was yeah. quite um yes, I remember that album quite well, actually. Yes, it was a good one. Yeah, so then yeah, but the sound of that album, I still think is just I mean, you know, it's now 32 years ago, but it does sound fantastic. You must be pleased here and re rediscovering it again and thinking, yeah, we 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 would cracked it. That was that was good. Yeah. You know, and, the songs on it, you know, I mean, Hey Venus sounds amazing. Sanitize sounds amazing. I mean, it all does yeah. come together. And and it because as a coherent album as well, it does sound brilliant. It, there's nothing bitty about it, is there? No, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great record, right? The songs speak for themselves. I, I do think that Scott made it a little too clean, you know, like he cleaned the guitar sounds up a little bit too much. Um, I would have liked a little bit more of the petrols coming through, but look, that's, that's not at the end of the day, most people can't tell, right? Most people aren't going to say whether or not the guitars were too loud or too soft. They're just like, I like that song or I don't like that song. Right. Yes. And at the end of the day, there was a ton of great music out at that point. Right. All of a sudden it wasn't just us. If you're looking to buy a guitar record, you know, there was all of the grunge stuff, there was Jellyfish. There were like all of these great bands. There was Oasis coming out. There's like all of these bands. And all of a sudden it was a, it was a guitar frenzy again. Yes, uh, absolutely. But that that leading to your last album then, I mean, when you went to record it, did it feel like it was going to be, to quote Jim Morrison, the end? Was there that feeling within the band that um, you were just about to, at the, the last hurdle? Well, uh, you know, the joke is, um <laughs> that Raymond and, and Kieran used to quit the band so frequently it was just like me and Damien would every year have to you know convince people come on let's go let's make listen we've already got half the songs written what else are we gonna do what are you gonna do if we're not playing France on Saturday you know because we used to play France almost every weekend um and so when we got back together to do uh fireproof and by this point, we had fired John Marquini as a bass player and brought in our last bass player, Brendan. And Brendan brought a whole new level of musical achievement to the band. Like he play, he was the first bass player we had. It was actually a bass player, right? Right. Damien was the first guitar player. John Marquini was really sort of electronic a guy. And he just, he, he wasn't a great bass player. Whereas Brendan just came in and this, bottom end just exploded and he would turn around and face Kieran and just lock with him. And the two of them, he would push Kieran really hard. And then the two of them would push the rest of the band. And all of a sudden, you know, we were just this force. So when we went in to make that record, it didn't feel like we were making our last record. We just thought like we're making, this is going to be, 
even just as good, if not better than kind of yes. crazy. And we thought, you know, because we were going to produce it ourselves, it was finally, and I, I still maintain that fireproof is the petrols. That is what we sounded like live, or that is what I always wanted us to sound like. And going back and listening to live tapes and stuff, it's the closest approximation to our live sound. So I was thrilled with that record. But unfortunately, that was the record where we realized that everybody had moved on, right? It, it just, we couldn't, we couldn't get a review. We couldn't get gigs. Um, you know, and by that, I mean, yeah, we could get gigs, but we could just get little tiny, small gigs. No one was really interested. We thought, you know, we'll play smaller venues to like get things going again. We'd get, we'd play smaller venues and they wouldn't sell out. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, oh, geez. And, you know, at that point, you've just cracked 30 something. And, you know, it's, it's laughable now, but you think I'm too old. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's laughable in retrospect, but at the time, you, you know, you're, you're really, and you're still fragile. You're this angry young man and you're just, oh my God, my life is over. What is going to happen? Right. But, at, and the reality is if there's no money in your bank account, you've got to do something. Right. Yes. And everybody I mean, it, at that it, point. It, it was kind of interesting what you said about that, because I know from talking to David Newton from my um, the Mighty Lemon Drops and also Paul from the Primitives, it was that they had that same experience. It was like we brought out the fifth or sixth album and no one wanted to review it. And our fans didn't want to come and see us. And we were just kind of finished. It was like we were just like there was just nothing there was just no energy coming back and forth and we just were, you know, so that was kind of the end of the band really. So you, you had a very similar experience, even though Brit pop appears and you have these shine compilations and the band would have easily right. fitted in with that scene up until probably 1997, you know, it's kind of strange, isn't it? You know, like you get, you know, pulp who suddenly make a bit of a comeback after being around for about 10 years and yet, mm -hmm. you know, and some mm -hmm. bands do, but, you know, it just it is difficult kind of holding it together. You know, you don't realize this as a as a punter and as a fan, what it must be like as a as a musician and in a band trying to think, my God, we've been we've gone up in the venue world. And now we're going slightly down again. That's yeah. That's... I mean, we've we've long since agreed that really what we should have done is we just should have taken a sabbatical. Right. We should have taken a year off um, during that year off, Karen and everybody would have just been brimming full of songs and optimism and, you know, fine, go and, and more importantly, take a year off and go work and then realize, wow, this really sucks. We <laughs> should go back to being poor musicians because anything's better than work. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because when I moved back to Seattle, as when all the London bands would come through, they'd all come stay with me or I'd go to their gigs or whatever. So, you know, like the Tinder sticks and uh, all of those bands, like, you know, good mates. And they would all be like it towards the end of their tour. And they're like, Oh, thinking about packing it in. And I would just go, don't right. <laughs> Do not. I said, because then you're going to be just like me. And I tell you this, this is not fun being on the other side of it. Now I had a, ba I, I started another band when I was out here and, um, you know, we put a record out, but again, it was more of the same. Like nobody really wanted to hear it. It's a great record though. Um, so had we have taken a sabbatical, I think we could, you know, we had records in us. Raymond and Kieran are still writing, right? I am yes. still writing. Right? We're all still writing. Damien just put out a new record the other day. Somebody said, have you heard Damien's new record? He, he didn't bother to tell me that he put out a new record. So look, there's plenty of music in us. And I think we could have stayed together and we should have we should have just taken the los lobos approach right just like hey, hey it might take 10 albums but we're good and eventually enough people are going to figure it out and particularly in europe where we would go play festivals yeah and we had a really really strong following over in europe and it's a brilliant place to play it's not like the princess lester and charlotte <laughs> where, or princess charlotte and lester That's where right. you get a can of nasty chili and that was your rider you know, you go to Europe and you get treated like royalty. They're like, thank you for producing to us. And like, I, I wish we had done that, but uh, you know, 
hindsight's 2020 and yeah uh, absolutely i mean it is kind of boggling because i saw the david bowie film this year moon age daydream and obviously i've always been a bit obsessed with him and sort of curious about his life the 60s which are a bit odd and then his 70s work of like doing one album a year you know uh-huh. for that whole decade producing a couple of albums with iggy and lou reed doing lots of tours doing a couple of films and you're thinking my god i'm relocated and got married uh-huh. and then got divorced and you're thinking you packed a lot in but then you know managed to hold his nerve during that late 80s where the music wasn't that amazing and then sort right. of to his little bit of a level in the 90s and on and and yeah but I, you know, it must be very difficult as a creative artist and dealing with one's own emotions and the dynamicness of a band of how do you navigate those kind of moments where people go, no, we don't really care about this new album. But perhaps then, you know, down the line, we might be interested. It is it is bizarrely difficult, isn't it? That is the thing. Well, and I mean, that's why you see so many people going solo, right? Because uh, navigating uh your own ups and downs is difficult enough as a musician trying to thread that through five very very strong personalities like the petrols were is almost impossible right and then it's at that point it's not just the personalities it's the personalities and their wives and their children and people's allegiances are split so many different ways it's a lot different if you can just be like david bowie and go well i'll just put out another record i'll throw a band together and and that also was helped him resuscitate his career right because every time he'd bring in some fresh blood right okay you know let's i call us olimar always brilliant but let's bring in a different drummer let's bring in a different bass player let's bring in a different lead guitarist and every time he'd put a new twist into that you know and when you're a band of five people you don't you can't do that right you just have to figure out how do we make something new with what we've got and it's it's just it's difficult Yeah. Did it take you a while to then find your musical moment again after the Petrels? Because I know you did a song or band called Stag, didn't you? But that's quite, is that quite recent, that particular combo? That's, that's been the last 10 years. So we've been doing that for the last 10 years. But literally when I got back, the minute I got back to Seattle, I started songwriting uh, with a partner over here and we put out an album under the name Anodyne. Yes. Uh, But there was already an anodyne in the UK or Ireland or something. So when the album came out over there, it was under the name Marfa Lights. But, you know, I sort of had to do that to sort of self-heal. Uh, because I, to be honest, I thought when the Petrels broke up, someone would just ask me to join their band, right? I thought like, <laughs> I'm awesome, right? Somebody's going to want me as their lead singer and nobody did. And so then not only did they not like the Petrels, now they don't even like me. And I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> yes. So I went back to the to US and a friend, his band had just broken up. He was in a band called Hammerbox who had their moment in the grunge explosion. And the two of us started writing songs. And then I found my voice again. Like yes. it was, and I was playing guitar. So I got to play guitar. I got to sing. And, you know, we played up and down the West coast. We did a uh, South by Southwest. We did the whole sort of, you know, American indie band thing. And it made me realize and appreciate again, you know, how much easier it was in Europe, right? Where you could an hour away and you're you're in an interesting place to play. And it might even be just on the other side of London. Yeah. Whereas in the US, <laughs> that next gig Brighton. is five hours away and it costs you $150 to get there. So if you're not making at least that, you know, <laughs> you're losing. Yeah, well, uh- I did have a few embarrassing conversations with Americans who, you know, said things like, oh, yeah, we drove seven hours to this place to go and see The Clash. And I thought, oh, my God, I didn't even bother going to see a band because it was like 30 minutes away. (laughs) I thought, you know, it's really bad. You know, it's like, yeah, we spent a whole day driving (laughs) to see The Clash. And it's like, shit, yeah, Yeah, there you go. That's hard. But one thing I did notice doing a lot of uh, interviews with American bands and like K Records is that there's a lot more fluidity with lineups. You know, people just go, oh, yeah, we're in this band. We do this project. We do this couple of albums. And then we all shuffle around because he leaves or she goes. And then they form another band and then we form another band. Is that is that the impression that I get, which is not quite right? Or is it the case that actually in America, people do like to just go, right, let's get together. Let's do that. Oh, you're going to be leaving now. Bye. Well, we'll get another band. It just, you know, it's just kind of curious and I'm kind of interested in that kind of world because it doesn't have that vibe in the UK so much. Yeah, I, I, I there are certain collectives, you know, like the Elephant Six Collective, where they all play in each other's records. But I think that's pretty unique, right? I think for the most part, you know, people get together. Now, 
And it also de depends on level of success, right? So if you've got a band together and you're doing really well, then you're going to go on the road together and you're going to tour that album. Uh, but certainly like what I do right now in the U in Seattle is I play with stag, but I get invited on stage with other bands all the time, but it's just because it's a little local thing and we do it because it's just our passion, right? It's not, yeah. about, we're not trying to be living off this. We just like playing music and people are like, Hey, that guy can sing, come up here and sing pump it up by Elvis Costello. No problem. I know all the lyrics, right? <laughs> so there's lots of that that goes on. Right. Um, and certainly, again, it, 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 it depends on the age group. So in my age group, you know, like there's, there's still a whole bunch of 50 year olds in Seattle from the grunge movement who are still making music and we all help each other out. Right. It's like somebody needs a bass player. Well, that guy will play bass. And so, yeah, amongst our age, but none of us are doing this for a living. Right. It's just because we like making records, the people who are trying to make a career out of it and put a, put records out and get on the road. You know, those are the youngins and they're like, four youngins who are prepared to get in a transit van and drive seven hours together, which us 50 year olds are like, yeah, not doing that. Nope. <laughs> so absolutely. listen, David, um, I am absolutely enjoying this conversation, but I have to leave because I have to take my mother to the dentist of all things. No, that's absolutely fine. Just quickly then we've put in this compilation uh, cut box set together. Did the, did the band kind of all come together, not uh, physically, but uh, virtually? Did you all sort of just kind of work together slightly for sort of a period of time to do this? It, it wasn't that. I mean, we'd all we'd done all the listening parties. And so we had literally just gone through the entirety of our catalog, including a listening party that was called B-Sides and Rarities. Right. Right. So we had played through everything and, and it gave us. I mean, it was amazing because you know everybody got to be a fly on the wall while the four of us because john o'neill didn't participate john Marquini didn't participate and brendan didn't participate even though they all were invited yeah. so it just ended up being the four of us and all of our fans got to just sort of sit there and listen while we listened to records went oh that's not very good and the four <laughs> of us would argue about what we should have done and then we go like well remember when you played that bit oh i didn't like that and so it was kind of like therapy and right out in front of everybody, but we had literally just gone through our entire catalog and we knew what we wanted to be on this, right? We're like, okay. And, and then we, you know, the emails went about, there was a couple of phone calls. Um, uh, Raymond said, Hey, I'll take the lead on the artwork. And, you know, I'm so far away over here in Seattle. I'm like, I totally trust you. Send me the PDF when you're done. Uh, so I can just make sure that, you know, everything is spelled correctly. And Damien and I worked on the, or, Raymond and I worked on the credits together to make sure everybody was credited on the right songs. And so it was definitely collaborative. Excellent. Well, it's nice, isn't it? It's an, well, it's an amazing collection, but you must take your mum to the dentist, frankly. <laughs> you can't miss with that one, especially if you're in the UK. But look, thank you ever so, so much, Stephen. If you want, I can always send you the link for this and you can always use it elsewhere. But um, And I'll send it to the guys from um, all the women from Demon as well um, when I put it out. Absolutely. So Let me know. And you know, I'll put it on that Petrol Emotion site. I'll oh, brilliant. On all of our socials and I'll get the, the boys to pump it up as well. So absolutely. It's been a, a, a pleasure talking yes, to you this has i been cannot good. believe that we were probably at the same butthole surfer show <laughs> i know that was excellent wasn't it yes i know that was quite a, it was a summer's evening i seem to remember it was a nice day and libby oh yeah, yeah it was an amazing gig anyway look you must have a go i uh, must go and do your um dentist deal bit good Brilliant. bit for the day take care thanks a lot steve take care okay take care Cheers. thanks bye -bye. and that was me in conversation with steve mack just in case you hadn't noticed <laughs> Um, a massive thank you. And also just to say the uh, box set is out, Demon Records, uh, the anthology 84 to 94. It's amazing and uh, it's worth discovering those tracks and albums you may have missed the first time. So this has been The C86 Show. Um, you can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just to C86 Show and you'll find it. And um, also these have all been archived. Aren't you lucky? So you can find those on Spotify, Podbean and um, iTunes. Who could forget? Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.